So this week on the podcast, we had Hart Montgomery, the CTO of Hyperledger. I think it's kind of no secret at this point that I love discussing Hyperledger. It's like talking about a digital asset ecosystem without any hype. All the noise is sort of dialed down. At least that's my impression. So I'm back to the well with Hart Montgomery, and there's more to come. I'm going to keep covering this. There's so much depth to this whole system. But on this episode, we start to discuss how projects evolve within the Hyperledger ecosystem. We talk about Firefly and Salong, some of the newer projects that really get into interoperability and like the Solidity compiler. So, And we start to delve into how Hyperledger is integrating with the public blockchain and building more tools to do so. And then we turn back end into a discussion about security for open source projects. So another great episode on Hyperledger. I hope by listening to this podcast, you'll pick up a lot of data points on Hyperledger to explore. And with that, I bring you Hart Montgomery. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a podcast exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel and your host. Join me on this journey exploring the reach of these transformative technologies. So excited today to have Hart Montgomery. He is the CTO of Hyperledger Foundation. Welcome, Hart. Thanks a lot for having me, Eric. It's great to talk to you today. Excellent. So uh, everybody knows that I love to have a lot of coverage about Hyperledger on my podcast. It's a very interesting space. And it's funny, just before this podcast started, Hart and I were talking about, you know, you know, what it's like going from an academic background into the CTO. But uh, I think that's actually a good jumping point for your background. What brought you to uh, what brought you to Hyperledger and how is it different from what you did before? That's a great question. It was sort of a long and, you know, I guess, lucky story. Um, so I started, you know, with a very academic background. Um, uh, I had the enormously good luck to be able to do my PhD under Dan Bonet at Stanford, as I know a lot of your guests have also uh, had the opportunity to study under Dan at some point. Um, and then I went and worked for uh, Fujitsu um, and I did you know, cryptography and, and blockchain research at Fujitsu. And I was sort of the first blockchain researcher at Fujitsu uh, when I started in 2015. Uh, it was right when sort of the you know, the forward looking big companies, right? You know, the big companies that were uh, on sort of the cutting edge were, were starting to really get involved uh, in the blockchain space. Uh, so I got involved in that. And, uh, you know, one of, the Fujit one of the Fujitsu objectives was was working in open source blockchain and working on Hyperledger. Uh, and so I, I did that as a part of my job at Fujitsu. Uh, and then, uh, you know, was at Fujitsu for seven years. It was a great experience. Uh, I worked at I worked with Hyperledger for probably six of those years. Uh, and then, you know, I, I really enjoyed working in open source and, and all that came with it. So then when the CTO job at Hyperledger opened up, I, you know, was excited and I thought it was a great opportunity to, you know, really work on stuff I enjoyed. So that's kind of how I wind up, wound up in this role. Excellent. Excellent. And how would you contrast uh, this role with the roles that you previously had? Like some of the unique challenges? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, there's so much going on in Hyperledger. There's such a huge amount of activity on a lot of different stuff. Uh, it's impossible to sort of know everything, even if it's your job to know as much as possible. Uh, when you're in academia, you know, you often focus on a very specific topic or a number of small specific topics. And you try to know everything about that topic, all of the papers, all of the research, you know, who's doing what. And you feel very comfortable answering questions or, or talking about that stuff in the space. And it's sort of a challenge, you know, moving to a, to a broader space, you know, where, where you can't know everything, where it's, you know, it's big enough. Uh, it's just impossible for one single person. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of, you know, learning on the fly, uh, which, which I, I really enjoy. Uh, but it's also, it, it can be a challenge at times. Yeah. It's funny when Daniela was on the podcast earlier, we were talking about all the different projects and, you know, it really struck me how, you know, even at the foundation level, part of the job is to figure out all the different places where Hyperledger is actually making an impact through conferences and case studies. But like there are there are use cases which you may not even know about because it's open source, which I've just found like, you know, wow. You know, it's like you want to be able to trumpet like, hey, here are all our implementations, but some of those you don't even know. So you can't even publicize them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. People always ask, uh, you know, what's the most popular implementation or what's the most popular, you know, use case? Uh, and we always have to say, you know, this is what we know, but, you know, take this with a huge grain of salt <laughs> because people don't always tell us. 
Uh, in some cases, they don't want to, you know, um, but but a lot of work is done on in sort of a consulting basis, right? And and then, you know, even people that we work with regularly, you know, companies that contribute that are members will often not tell us about the projects that they're working on because they're doing it with some, you know, client or customer that has, you know, some some sort of confidentiality agreement in place. Uh, so often on a lot of these questions, we're just guessing and we have to tell people like, hey, you know, if you're doing something, tell us what you're doing. You know, we, we can publicize it. But, you know, the code base turns up in all kinds of places you wouldn't expect. So you ever have any cases where like maybe a partner like blasts this like great announcement and you're saying they're going, that could be Hyperledger, but we don't know. All the time. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not, you know, usually they're not directly using Hyperledger out of the box, but we've seen a number of, of announcements where we think that might be a fork of something, <laughs> you know, in, in the Hyperledger code base. Yes. It's not uncommon at all. Yeah. Welcome to decentralization, right? I think it's a great idea to start off with the big categories, the buckets, uh, if you would, of, of what Hyperledger does, what, pro what, what you know, what uh, technologies fall into each before we jump into some of the hot new things. Absolutely. So how I like to describe Hyperledger is the Linux Foundation's umbrella project for blockchain and blockchain related uh, work. So, you know, the Linux Foundation uh, fundamentally solves the problem of, you have a code base that lots of different companies or individuals want to work on together but there's no single point of trust, right? There's no one company that can be trusted to hold the code base, right? Uh, and, you know, if you think about this, this, this sort of makes a lot of sense, you know, why you would need a, a third party, you know, neutral organization to handle this, right? You know, uh, if IBM contributed their blockchain code in, in a way that they just open sourced it, right? You know, it, they just pushed it out on GitHub, you know, uh, sort of, if you're a competitor of IBM, would you really want to build on that code? Would you want to work on that code? If, you know, someone, uh, you know, they could take it away in a, a heartbeat, right? Or they could, you know, push the project in a direction that deliberately broke your applications, right? And, you know, not that they would, but, but that's a, a possibility that you'd have to worry about, right? Um, so, you know, if, and if you want people to collaborate and work together, then you need to, to push it to a sort of neutral third party organization. Um, and, you know, this was essentially the rationale for Hyperledger Fabric and sort of why it was the first project in Hyperledger and, and even more why Hyperledger got started. Um, but this sort of, you know, decentralized development it is the, the reason that the Linux Foundation exists. And it's a really nice tie into blockchain, right? Because the whole purpose of blockchain is, is decentralization. Uh, and, and I point out that, you know, uh, if you don't have decentralized development, you know, is, is that really what, what you want in blockchain, given the whole point is decentralization? Um, so, but, but back to your question, the Hyperledger Foundation is about, you know, it's the open uh, umbrella for blockchain in the Linux Foundation. And we have a number of, of different projects. So I sort of lump things into four categories. Uh, and not all projects fit exactly into these categories, but, but it's an approximate thing. Uh, we have distributed ledgers, right? So we have Fabric, which probably everyone knows. Uh, we have Besu, which you know is, is an Ethereum execution client, and there's some permissioned uh, modules that that you can use to run Besu in a, a permissioned setting. Um, you know, we have uh, you know obviously uh, Eroha uh, and Sawtooth, um, and you know then we have. Uh, we have a whole identity stack. So uh, distributed I or decentralized identity, self-sovereign identity is a huge application. Um, you know, I like to think of it as the backbone for sort of Web3 uh, because everything, if, if you want to do things in a decentralized way, you need to have a, a consistent identity that you can sort of, you know, use across different systems. Uh, but you want to be able to use it in a privacy preserving way. So we have a stack of now uh, Indy, which is actually a ledger, but it's a ledger focused on identity. So I'll put it in the identity stack. Uh, we have uh, Aries, uh, Ursa, and Anoncreds, uh, each which sort of address a different part of the identity stack. And I can go into that in more detail later. Um, you know, we have uh, 
a, a host of new projects that I would say focus on blockchain interoperability and integration. So, you know, everyone sort of sees, you know, we're going to be living in a world of many networks, right? There's not going to be any one blockchain that, you know, is the best for every single application out there, right? Um, and as, you know, we replace sort of traditional systems with blockchains, you know, these traditional systems, these old databases have to talk to each other, right? So, uh, you know, so obviously these blockchains are going to have to talk to each other. You know, we're, we've already seen a lot of interest in, you know, cross-chain transactions, you know, moving assets across chains even. Uh, and I, we just think that's going to get bigger and bigger. And so, uh we have a number of, of projects and people working on that aspect of, of interoperability and integration. Um, you know, and we also have people sort of working on the, the style of project that is, you know, write code once and, and use it anywhere, right? It's, it'd be sort of frustrating uh, if you wrote blockchain code once and then you had to duplicate it for every single ledger that you wanted to, to work. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, projects like Firefly uh, it's sort of like a middleware container uh, for blockchain. So we'll get into Firefly because that's one of the hot new things. So one thing I find interesting is that, you know, because Fabric was one of the, it, it, I, I don't know if I'd say it's the most popular, but it's certainly one of the most well-known Hyperledger projects. And it, it certainly uh, is, is one of the most utilized, but there is an impression that uh, where you associate Hyperledger with sort of a one transaction orderer that you would get under Fabric. And, and some of the later projects, maybe people aren't connecting the dots quite as much because as you move into Sawtooth and Besu, they do support both permissioned and unpermissioned, you know, the, the, and each node potentially being an orderer. So it, it is a fairly comprehensive stack as it relates to permissioning and ordering of transactions and different mechanisms for achieving it. Uh, so, you know, like Besu is an open source Ethereum client. Um, so that's, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty, uh, exciting when you think about it and you think about like all the different developments, like, you know, we're, we're going to talk about Firefly next, just how Hyperledger is, is building out all these different projects to be more compatible with what a lot of people in the digital asset space look to for, you know, a tokenized market, but you could, you don't have the distraction of it before we touch on that. Um, let's talk a little bit about when you say we have people working on these things. You, you know, why don't you to develop that a little bit and, 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 and you know, how how projects are added to um, to Hyperledger? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question or comment. Um, and when I say we have people working on, you know, I mean, we have uh, open source contributors, uh, you know, donating their time and, and working on, you know, open source code. And donating might be a little bit too, uh, it might be too generous. You know, a lot of these people are paid, you know, full time uh, by companies to work on open source projects. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, from a company perspective, uh, if you're building a, a business that's based on an open source project, you know, it, it certainly makes sense to, to have some people uh, working on that project and, and developing it and making sure it, it stays, you know, in good health. And we have some very interesting contributors from, from some very interesting places. Uh, you know, perhaps one of my favorite facts is we have a number of employees uh, from the government of British Columbia uh, who are full-time developers on our identity stack. Uh, and I think that I've always thought that's really cool. And those those folks are are, are really fantastic. And and great to work with. Um, but to address your question, uh, we have a, a whole process on how code and projects come into Hyperledger. Uh, it's relatively similar across different parts of the Linux Foundation. Uh, there's obviously some variation between projects, uh, but we have a number of different designations for projects. Uh, we have labs, uh, which is sort of the lowest bar, you know, when we have projects, which we call, which we have two tiers of projects. We have projects in incubation and graduated projects. And those sort of reflect the maturity of the community around the project. Uh, to get a project into labs, uh, you know, you just need to get a, a couple of people that, you know, we have as, as what we call lab stewards to sign off on your project, you know, to sort of decide it's 
it's relevant to blockchain. Uh, but you know, labs are about experimentation. We don't really hold people to you know a super high standard for that. It's a place to showcase your code. Really, you know, it's like, hey, we did this, um, and, and that's what we want it to be. <laughs> Once we get to projects, uh, it's more about you know, do we see this you know being a, a viable open source project in the long term, uh, and sort of you know, a project in incubation. Uh, has to be approved by the technical oversight committee, uh, you know, where they, you know, there's a, there's a document and a process and it's basically just checking off the boxes. Uh, you know, do you have what it takes uh, in place to eventually succeed as an open source project? And, you know, obviously not every project succeeds, uh, you know, and it's, we, we wouldn't be doing a good job if, if every project succeeded, that would imply we're much too restrictive about what we're, you know, what we're encouraging people to try. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's generally a, a process of just making sure that, that people are in the right position to succeed. And then a graduated project, uh, you know, is, is another approval step from our technical oversight committee. And that sort of indicates that, you know, uh, you know, the project is in a good spot it's following best security practices. It's doing good release management, all that stuff. Where you know we we think it's it's basically uh, you know okay you can trust production, you know you you can use this in production, sort of an indicator. Um, so that's sort of how our uh, it's what we call the project life cycle, um, you know and and generally you know we do see a lot of projects that go from labs to projects in incubation to graduated projects, and we've also seen some projects wind down. Um, you know, when uh, other stuff comes around or, or, you know, people want to move on to different things and decide, you know, the project really, you know, didn't achieve its goals. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, maintaining healthy code uh, and, you know, signaling to people, you know, like being totally transparent, you know, this is what state the code is in. This is what state the, the project is in. So that's really interesting because like uh, I was I was prepping for this call and I I wanted to, you know, I was, I was digging through the Hyperledger site and I encourage obviously anybody who's interested to do so because there's a lot of information on it. But I was seeing this distinction and at first I was just sort of like, oh, well, why is, why is Firefly they got the big announcement and this other one doesn't. Then I then I was like, hold it, hold it. It's they they use different words <laughs> to describe where they are in their evolution. So uh, it 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 does. Uh, you know, t t tomorrow's Firefly is probably already in a lab. Um, and there's t yeah. yeah, there's tons of there's tons of projects in the lab and they're they're working their way up. So when they are released as a full blown project, that's a great signal. Yeah. And, and labs are also great for collaboration. Like a lot of times we see people uh, working on labs that are very similar. Uh, and so we'll say, hey, you know, have you all thought about, you know, working with this other team, you know, because you all are are doing, you know, very, very similar things. Um, and so, you know, we have a number of different uh, collaboration efforts where sort of uh, projects have have merged or moved together over time like Cacti, um, which is the interoperability project, uh, it sort of has a funny genesis. Uh, and, and I was involved in that back to my time at Fujitsu. Uh, so, so basically, you know, uh, we were at a Hyperledger conference, I believe in Tokyo, I believe it's the Tokyo Member Summit. Uh, you know, and I was talking to some of the folks from Accenture, like Mike Klein and Tracy Kurt, who are fantastic. Uh, and we basically realized we were, planning on building almost the same thing for interoperability and open sourcing it. And then, you know, we sort of had like, you know, an all shucks moment. Well, maybe we should just work on this together in open source. And so we, you know, published our code as labs, merged it together, uh, became Cactus. And, you know, later on, lo and behold, IBM is working on something similar. Uh, so, you know, they, they called Weaver. And so now they're, you know, merging that code base into to Cacti. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a really, the labs are a great setup for collaboration as well. Excellent. And you get big teams all at once, right? <laughs> uh, well, there's so in, in duplicating effort, right? If you're, if you're, you know, if two people want to build the same thing and they're okay working together, they, they should work together. And that's a big part of our job as, you know, Hyperledger staff is to, um, is to make sure that, you know, 
people sort of know about other projects that are, are doing similar things um, and, and, you know, giving them, giving them the option to work together if they so desire, you know, we, we don't, you know, make people work together. Uh, and there are some cases where people would prefer not to work together and, and that's okay. Uh, but we don't want people not to work together because they, they don't know about something. Right. It's like the job of good managers to like what, remove barriers and facilitate, uh, you know, synergy. So, um, could you break down, you, you, you talked about a number of identity solutions. Could you, mm-hmm. could you break them down a little bit into their particular use cases? Uh, sure. So do you want me to go into the stack or the, the identity stack or identity use cases? Um, we could try both. <laughs> okay. Sure. So, uh, so the primary Hyperledger identity stack right now is, is four projects. It's Indy, uh, Ares, Ursa, and Anoncreds. Uh, so each of these projects sort of serve different roles. So Indy is a ledger that is specifically focused on identity applications. Uh, so it does not have a lot of the smart contract functionality that you might want in a general purpose ledger. Uh, it is, you know, optimized basically exclusively for a handful of of identity applications. Uh, So URSA is the cryptography layer. So URSA is where people put the, you know, cryptographic protocols that are used in this stack. And and there are a number of other projects that use URSA as well, like Aroha uses URSA. Um, But at least in the identity stack, it it functions as the cryptography layer. Um, Ares is, uh, is technically an agent uh, but if you're not familiar with that term, you can sort of think of it as a wallet. Uh, so it's sort of the wallet layer. And then Anoncreds uh, is the layer of anonymous credentials protocols, which which obviously use the cryptography layer. Uh, but, you know, anonymous credential protocols are, are much more than than just cryptography. Uh, so, so there's a lot of... Uh, of code in that project as well. And the, the idea is it, uh, it, it's as modular as possible. Um, so anonymous, the non-creds or anonymous credentials is actually uh, a very new project. Uh, and it was created so that the identity stack could be run on, you know, multiple different platforms. Whereas previously, most people ran this identity stack on Indy. Now the idea is that you could run a non-creds and Aries on, you know, whatever blockchain or system you desire. Excellent. All right. So I guess maybe um, we talked a little bit about a non-creds, which I guess is new, right? It's w- one of the newer projects. Let's talk a little bit about Firefly and Solang. Sure. So I like to think of Firefly and Solang as, as projects that sort of solve the, as I said before, the right code for once, run it anywhere uh, problem. And these projects go about it in different ways, right? So Firefly uh, creates what they call the super node, uh, which I, you know, this isn't exactly accurate, but I think it's a a reasonable abstraction, right? It's the old saying that no models are accurate, but some are useful. Um, I like to think of Firefly as kind of like a middleware or or a container for blockchain, where the idea is you can write, you know, smart contracts and and, and everything you want for a particular blockchain application. you can write it once and you can run it anywhere using the Firefly stack, right? Any blockchain that the Firefly you know, stack supports, uh, which is quite a lot and, and sort of more than I can keep track of at this point, uh, you know, they support. And Solang, right, is, is a Solidity compiler for Solana and, and, and Substrate, right? So the idea is that you can, you know, take your Solidity code and compile it uh, into, you know, smart contract code that can be useful uh, on these other platforms. And, you know, that might be really useful if you're, uh, you know, if you're a Solidity shop or, you know, you have Solidity developers and you want to run on these other platforms. Excellent. And then what was the process for Solang being accepted as the latest project? Well, they were a lab for a while. Uh, they had a lot of momentum. They had uh, recently gotten more developers working on it. 
Uh, and so one of the one of the criteria that we look at, you know, or more precisely, our, our technical oversight committee looks at when, you know, deciding whether to promote a lab into a project or not is whether there's a diversity of developers and, and companies doing the development effort. So what we don't want, and, and not only Hyperledger, but sort of any open source, open development project, is we don't want the project to fail if sort of one person goes away or one company goes away, right? You know, we want it to be diverse and decentralized enough where it can survive, you know, if if, if one person or one company goes away. And, and so, you know, Solang had gotten, you know, some more interest, you know, other developers were working on it. And so it, it seemed to be in a place uh, where it was mature enough to move to a project in incubation status. And obviously, you know, um, it, it goes without saying that everybody thought that the the problem that they were trying to solve was really interesting. So they were clearly uh, in an area that interested our community. Excellent. So um, in the past podcast, we've covered this notion of choosing the right architecture. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about what what uh, some uh, some of our prior podcasters, uh, podcast guests like Matt Zand or, or uh, Raphael Belchur and Daniela laid out as being some of the considerations. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll, you'll, you'll shape and modify it so we, you know, we're, we're collaborating, right? <laughs> collaborating with prior episodes. So, um, you know, Zan started out, with, Matt Zan started out saying, you know, is blockchain even the right solution? That's, that's a great first question. And, and then suggested using a data flow to determine um, whether it is and asking the question whether it's public, private, or hybrid. Yeah, so blockchain is about decentralization, right? Uh, and so sort of the metric I use and I encourage people to use is, you know, a, a blockchain is is a distributed database with decentralized trust where, where you don't have to, you know, trust any one single entity, right? Um, and, and do you need a blockchain sort of, you know, boils down to, to do you need this primitive, right? You know, is there one single actor who is willing and able to sort of, you know, act as the host and, and be the source of truth for this, this information store? And, and do other people trust this actor, right? Uh, and if, the, if there is an actor and people do trust them, then, then you don't need a blockchain, right? You know, you can just have this, this entity sort of manage uh, everything. Um, but if there is no one single entity that everyone trusts and is, is sort of willing and able to manage things, uh, and I say willing and able because there are a lot of use cases where uh, there may be a, a single entity who people trust, but they're not, you know, they're not able to to manage a whole, you know, information stream or database. I guess you see this a lot in like regulated financial industries where maybe the regulator. Uh, people do trust and are willing to share data with, but the regulator is not capable of hosting a system containing all of the data. Um, so, uh, but, but once you've decided that, that you do need decentralization, and again, you know, you, you don't necessarily need it for every application, then it comes down to how much decentralization you need, right? So I don't think of, you know, blockchain or, or distributed ledgers as, as sort of, you know, being decentralized or not, right? There's all continuum of decentralization. It, it can depend on a lot of things from like governance to your consensus algorithm, right? You know, uh, on one end, right, at least in theory, uh, not always in practice, but at least in theory, you know, fully public blockchains, right? That use, you know, proof of work or, or a public proof of stake protocol would appear to be the most decentralized, right? Uh, you know, and on the far other end, you have traditional databases, right? But there are a lot of choices you can make in between, right? You know, you could use, you know, uh, some sort of distributed ledger with a Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithm, right? You know, and, and a robust governance mechanism that would sit somewhere in the middle, probably of for decentralization, right? Um, you know, you could weaken your decentralization guarantees if you wanted to use, say, crash fault tolerance, right? Um, and, and generally, though, as you weaken your decentralization guarantees, uh, you know, you also get better performance, right? So you want to go to the, the point of decentralization you need, you know, and the, but, but not really any further. 
Uh, and I guess this goes back to the famous uh, blockchain trilemma, right? Which sort of says uh, you can have, you know, uh, you can have some of, you know, security, uh, decentralization or, or performance, uh, but not all of them at the same time. Uh, and I sort of like to think that no one should compromise on security. Uh, so you should be specifically trading off between decentralization and performance. And speaking of the trilemma, when you look across all the different frameworks, do you think of that trade-off between decentralization and performance across the different frameworks? You know, some emphasizing the decentralization, others emphasizing more the performance, maybe some emphasizing security to even the detriment of both performance and um, decentralization? Well, not only between platforms, but also within platforms, right? You know, like Besu supports multiple consensus algorithms, right? And the, the effect of decentralization you get will depend on which consensus algorithm you use. Uh, same for just, you know, at least in a permission network, how many nodes you want to run, right? You know, if you run, you know, 10 nodes across 10 different organizations, you're getting more decentralization than if you just run four nodes, right? And a lot of it depends on the, the configuration of the network, right? And, and a lot of external factors, right? Uh, you know, for even this, this is even a question for, for public blockchains, right? You know, you can get into questions of, you know, what degree of centralization do you think mining pools, you know, force? You know, what about things like MEV, uh, you know, and, and flashbots and, and all of this other stuff? Uh, so, you know, it, it becomes a really complicated question uh, once you start diving into it. Do you see the various encryption technologies, and I'll put you know, ZKP and homomorphic encryption, um, whether partially or fully, you know, in, in that same bucket, do you see those types of technologies driving the need for um, more blockchain technologies, you know, more public blockchain technologies, because we have the capability to encrypt them, and it allows us to collect data from more, of a more diffuse set of sources? Yeah, so, uh, you know... Uh, <laughs> As someone with a cryptographic background, I'm a big fan of all of the, the ZKPs uh, and associated technologies uh, being used on blockchain. I think they're extremely useful uh, for a number of different applications. Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that uh, they will solely cause people to say, move from permissioned to public blockchain or, or things like that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things you have to think about when, when using uh, ZKPs. And ZKPs are great, but they're not, you know, just because you use ZKPs doesn't mean you, you know, get perfect privacy, right? There's still things like traffic analysis attacks. Uh, you know, there's still a whole number of things you need to consider uh, when you're, you know, thinking about privacy. Um, and, and so one of the things that, that I sort of, that, that always bugs me uh, is, um, you know, maybe you've seen the, the movie Dodgeball, uh, but I, like, I sometimes call, you know, what, what people do in blockchain is, is the Patches O'Houlihan strategy for privacy or, or security, where they just take a bunch of tools and they just throw tools at the problem uh, until they think they've solved it. Uh, but, you know, what, what you really should be doing is you should be thinking about, you know, what do you want? What privacy guarantees do you want? What security guarantees do you want? And then, you know, appropriately pick the, the cryptographic protocol or protocols that give you those guarantees. Um, and, and, you know, and obviously ZKPs are, are a great tool for this, uh, but you do have to think carefully about the guarantees you get. So while we're talking about security, um, you know, security obviously in the public blockchain space has been much more uh, of a concern over the last year. You know, that the hacks have gotten bigger and it seems like, you know, both uh, bridges seem to be a particular target as well as protocol hacks. Um, how has Hyperledger's community responded to this? Well, you know, we've tried to have, you know, rigorous security protocols in place, uh, you know, just 
you know, putting proper procedures in, in place, I, I think is, is most important. You know, uh, I don't view security as like, it's not a bit you, you flip on or off, right? You know, it, it's a process, you know, and just making sure that you have the right people in place and you have the right processes in place, you know, it is, it's about the best you can do, right? You know, uh, it's very tough to say like, you're not going to have security vulnerabilities. You're not going to have security issues. You know, everyone does, right? If you remember Heartbleed, right? Uh, even what is ostensibly supposed to be the most secure piece of code in existence, you know, had, had critical bugs. Uh, you know, so it's all about putting processes in place to sort of, you know, mitigate the severity and the impact of bugs and, and do all that you can uh, in that regard. Um, you know, we haven't seen as many, you know, sort of uh, critical issues in Hyperledger as, as necessarily some of the public chains. But, you know, I mean, the public chains are really juicy targets, right? You know, um, it's... Uh, if you find a zero day in fabric, it's not as clear how you would exploit it uh, as if you found a zero day in a, it's one of these bridges, right? You know, the bridge you can immediately take out, you know, vast amounts of money. So, right. With, with fa fabric, you would never get that. Then that's sort of the trade off, right? Um, so how do you, how, what would you, you know, so, so it's a question of, you know, like are, the attackers probably aren't as motivated uh, just because the the reward isn't as high, right? You know. So, but but in the context of Hyperledger, would you say that there's more of a sharing of security? So, for example, you have enterprises, larger enterprises, with sort of very developed security stacks. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's more secure necessarily, right? But nonetheless, they they have developed code audit penetration testing, assessment, SOC, whatever, you know, uh, vulnerability scanning, uh, but, but it's vulnerability scanning, probably less important. Penetration testing may be more important. Code review may be more important. Um, to, to what extent uh, does that make its way in the process? To what extent does the foundation leverage that? So for example, if, um, if, if a big partner runs a penetration test, finds a critical software bug, of course, they're going to, you're going to presume that they're going to let you know, or they're going to fix it and not let you know, who knows. But what does, or how does Hyperledger Foundation try to sort of ensure that it's collecting that kind of data on, on any bugs or potential vulnerabilities in, in the code base itself? Uh, we have a whole security disclosure process, um, you know, so, uh, we, we also do benefit from, you know, having a lot of, of security expertise uh, at all of the companies uh, that, that contribute. Well, not well, obviously some of the companies that contribute. Uh, we have a bug bounty program. Uh, you know, we do regular security audits. So, I mean, again, it, it's just about having the, the process and procedures in place, uh, you know, and we can't force people, obviously, to contribute bugs they find or, or to notify us, but, you know, we do our best to encourage them to do so. And generally we try to make it a, you know, a low effort process. So, you know, the incentives are there. You ever have a hackathon? Yeah, we do. We've had a number of hackathons and uh, we're, we're ramping this back up uh, now that, you know, people are, are willing to meet in public again, uh, post COVID. Um, so we definitely have those and, and, we're now trying uh, to to work more closely together with uh, OpenSSF uh, on some of the security stuff. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the OpenSSF. It's Open Source Security Foundation. It's a Linux Foundation project. Um, Brian Balendorf is who used to be in charge of Hyperledger uh, is in charge of that uh, from the LF perspective. Uh, and the idea was it sort of got started due to all of these like software supply chain bugs like log4j, uh, you know, where lots and lots of people were using this, you know, this like not so well-maintained program. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it caused a, a huge problem, right? Yep. Uh, so uh, actually, do you want to just kind of review that real quick? So, you know, for the listeners, because 
Yeah, sure. So I'll try to talk about this in, in sort of a general perspective. Uh, but, you know, most software today uses open source components. And when you're actually writing like a big software program, it's sort of like building, it's, it's like putting together a sausage. Uh, you know, you're going to pull from all of these different libraries and, you know, uh, and then you're going to package it together into a, a single uh, program. So, of course, you know, traditionally, right, you don't know what's in the sausage of what you're consuming. Uh, and someone might build a, a software package that they claim is secure, but really under the hood, they're, they're using several, you know, less secure or less studied uh, software packages. And, you know, if there's a vulnerability in one of these dependencies, well, you know, it can propagate up to the, to the top level project. Uh, and, and that's, that's a big problem. And that's sort of what happened with uh, the log for JBOG uh, at, at a very high level. Uh, and so, you know, one of the, the goals of the open SSF uh, is to, to help stop this kind of bug and to sort of make people aware of, you know, the software supply chain. Uh, so, you know, if there's a bug in a downstream project, you know, you can get notified uh, uh, and, and, you know, an update accordingly. And it's, uh, you know, it's uh, also, you know, focused on sort of project health metrics so that, you know, you can see if your dependencies are following best security practices, uh, all, all of this stuff. It's a really interesting project. Uh, and, you know, you can, we could easily do an entire uh, podcast talking about, you know, one of the like 10 tracks they're doing uh, at the Open SSF. Um, so, you know, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great, you know, you can talk to Brian about it or David Wheeler, all those guys do excellent work. Um, but yeah, it, it's a really good effort. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to sort of tie a Hyperledger closer to a lot of the stuff they're doing um, so that, you know, helps us and, and helps them. At least I like it helps them, but. It's a constant race, uh, you know, for security on, on as it relates to public or private uh, ledgers. Um, so, what do you see? Like, if you look out to the next couple of years, three to five years for Hyperledger, how do you see it developing? Whether it's you know versus other systems or or directions that it heads in, what really makes you excited when you look ahead? Oh man! If I could give you a great answer to this, I would. I would be a stockbroker or a venture capitalist. Uh, but you know, I think we're we're really seeing. You know, we're going to see more adoption of, of decentralization. I think we're going to see a lot of the traditional finance companies and banks that have been. You know, they're very conservative organizations by nature, uh, and they've been sort of slow to adopt. But I think we're going to really see people uh, start to adopt blockchain technology uh, for some of these use cases. You know, we've seen a ton of interest uh, in central bank digital currencies or, or CBDCs. This has really started to take off in the past year. Uh, you know, we're seeing more and more of this. And, and I think we're really going to see uh, an adoption in, in finance uh, that, you know, everyone has sort of predicted, but, you know, it, it's, it's taken time. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more hybrid systems. We're going to see a huge focus on interoperability, right? You know, everyone sort of accepted there's not going to be a, a blockchain to rule them all. Uh, and, you know, all of the blockchains and distributed ledgers are going to need to interact with all of the other blockchains and distributed ledgers and even legacy systems, right? You know, uh, you're going to want your blockchain to to be able to communicate and interact with centralized systems as well. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd say these are, are two trends. Um, I hope that people renew their focus on, on privacy and confidentiality and, and other things uh, for blockchain. I think digital identity is really starting to take off. Uh, you know, we've seen a number of governments start to adopt self-sovereign identity and, and similar principles. Uh, this is less popular in the U.S. than it is in Canada and Europe. So a lot of people in the U.S. are, are sort of, you know, uh, not as up to date on the trend. Uh, but, you know, I, I think digital identity is, is 
the backbone for everything in Web3. So I really expect to see that take off. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, it was uh, it was great to have you on the podcast. If anybody wants to learn more about what you do, where should they where should they go? Yeah, well, we have a ton of resources uh, on our website, on the wiki. Uh, so, uh, you know, on our GitHub. Uh, so it's all available online. You know, we're an extremely transparent and an open organization. You can find almost anything you want. Uh, and we encourage people to just, you know, join up. You know, we, we like having lurkers. If there's a meeting you want to join or an email list you want to join, just do it. Uh, you know, it, it's all available. It's all open in public. You know, so we encourage people to, to come out and, and get started and kick the tires on stuff. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me.